afternoon to everybody listening to the webinar on relapsing polychondritis. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Laurent Arnaud from Strasbourg, and he will present the French practical guidelines for the diagnosis and management of relapsing polychondritis. My name is Oliver Sander. I am from Düsseldorf in Germany. I'm a member of the disease group group and uh, Laurent Arnaud is the um, disease coordinator of the uh, Unreconnet disease group for relapsing polychondritis and he wrote the French practical guidelines who have been recently published and so mm -hmm. we will learn a lot of, about management and diagnosis of relapsing polychondritis. To add some important things to this webinar, the webinar will be recorded and published on the Earn Reconnect website and on YouTube channel. For questions during the webinar, use the questions and answer session in the Zoom black bar or use the chat. And we will address the questions to Laura no, after the presentation and discuss it later. So I'm happy to have Noro no with me, and he will now present the French guidelines. So good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the for the opportunity to be here. Just going to share my screen. Um, Oliver, can you confirm that this is full screen? It's full screen. Okay, perfect. Uh, and so indeed, I'm Laurent Arnaud, working in Strasbourg in France, and it is really a pleasure to share with you these uh, practical guidelines. Uh, for the diagnosis and uh, also therapeutic management of relapsing polychondritis. So uh, I'd like to say a, a quick word about Reconnet in a very general manner, because we are all members of Reconnet and we all recognize the importance of Reconnet. And I think one of the main ideas is to improve the quality of care across the borders and sometimes in areas where there is less expertise and so there is a great interest about making recommendations, um, studying clinical practice guidelines. And actually when Reconet was creating, uh, created in 2018, we, we first starting by doing a very practical exercise about the availability of practical guidelines for all connective tissue disease. And I must say that inside the group of relapsing polychondritis, we were not the very lucky ones, uh, because as you can see, we reviewed the literature and we found no paper. So it means that when we published this paper in RMD Open in 2018, there was nothing as a therapeutic guideline that was published for relapsing polychondritis. So really the idea was to correct that but I'm sure you know that relapsing polychondritis is a very rare and very under-researched area. Uh, what I'm showing on the, on the screen is the great increase in the number of uh, publications on PubMed every year. And if you take 2023, it looks like a great increase, but it's just 79 papers. And I'm sure you know that, but 79 is actually a very small number. In rheumatoid arthritis is more than 6,000 papers every year. Cystomic lupus is more than 4,000, almost 6,000 papers. So relapsing polychondritis is very much a, a rare and under-researched area. So you know about Reconet, but maybe you don't know about the French filière, fie 2 r which tries to create something quite similar, um, which is a network of care, of centers, expertise, competent centers for rare connective tissue disease. And actually I'm working in Strasbourg, as you can see in the Northeast of France, and we are one of the few uh, reference centers for, for the disease. And this has a great importance because within this network, we are trying to make French recommendations. And this is really what this talk is about. I'm going to present you this uh, Protocol National de Diagnostic et de Soins for Relapsing Polychondritis. So you may have seen, I'm showing you some QR codes. Uh, if you have your telephone, you can simply screen the, the QR codes and the publications, and I will show you many publications that are imported directly into your telephone. So I, I guess this is very practical for you who are listening to us today. 
So I'm not going to give you a full lecture about generalities, about relapsing polychondritis, but I'm really going to focus about this document. And of course, I'm going to show you slides in English. I'm not going to show you the, the French slides. But before I start, I just want to take one second to tell you what is a PNDS. PNDS, um, within this network that you've seen for France, we have a French national plan for rare diseases. So that is truly amazing because it means that the French government is funding research and activities for rare diseases. And I believe this is not the case everywhere in the world. Sometimes rare diseases are a bit forgotten disease. And I'm very happy and very proud in the good sense that we do something specific for that in France. And so PNDS stands for National Diagnosis and Care Protocols. Uh, these are protocols, usually kind of recommendations that are based on scientific evidence. It takes into account recommendations if there are recommendations, and we've seen that there are nothing recommended in, in the context of relapsing polychondritis. And of course, as you may guess, it follows a very specific methodology starting by a review of the literature. So I just want to say that this is a teamwork. Indeed, I was the coordinator uh, with some colleagues, Nathalie costedo Chalumeau, Alexis Matian, Laurent Sayer. Uh, but as you may guess, it's not just us three or four to, to make a full recommendation paper. We've been discussing with many colleagues. They are on, on the right side of the screen. And well, we included pediatricians, we included specialists, for the eyes, specialists for the ears, uh, specialists for hematology. So it's a very diverse background. And really the idea was to collect feedback for people who are really specialized in these diseases. And I'd like to acknowledge the role of Jean-Charles Piet, who is, I believe, a very important person in, in, in France, has been dedicated his life to the, the study of relapsing polychondritis. And we were very lucky to have him on board as a kind of mentor for the group. I, I think that was really amazing. So I'm going to breathe you through uh, the different pages, but I'm not going to do everything in detail. I just want to say that it starts by a summary for the family doctor. And we all know what happens when someone with a rare disease goes to the family doctor and say, hey, doctor, someone told me what I have. I have relapsing polychondritis. And then you see the eyes of the general doctor looking at the patient in a very surprised manner and usually telling you, I have never heard of this disease. And this is why I think this page is so important. It's a quick summary, which is in a language clear for general family doctors, just to give important information about the disease. So I'm not going to go into the detail, but it's a good, it's a good thing that you can take translate and give to your doctor if you need something like that. And actually, you can find very similar information on the website of Reconnect. I'm sure you have already visited the website, but this year we have updating the page about relapsing polychondritis, and it's similar. We provide very general but important information for the patients. And again, if you have never visited the, the web page of Reconnect, you screen the QR code, or you type the address that is on the screen, and it takes you directly to the proper page. So something I believe is also very important with this uh, PNDS is that it tells us what kind of professionals should be involved in the care of the disease. And uh, it, it gives a strong role to the family doctor, and I believe this is absolutely key. But also to specialist doctor, usually a rheumatologist or internist, but other specialists are also very important. And based on the involvement, it can be ophthalmologist, ENT specialist, hematologist, pediatrician. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But of course, there are other professionals, the nurses, the occupational therapist, the hearing ed acoustician, psychologist, social workers. And I'm very happy that these persons, these healthcare professionals are actually acknowledged in the publication. And then it gets medical, and it tells us very clearly what are the main objective of the initial assessment, initial consultation. And I would highlight four of these main objectives, which are to rule out what looks like relapsing polychondritis, but is not relapsing polychondritis, as a way, that's the point two, to make the diagnosis. 
then there is a very important step, which is to assess the severity of the disease. And I will tell you a bit later, there are tricks that enable us to know if someone is going to be severe or not so severe. And finally, of course, we need to search for another disease. I'll come back to that later, but we should not stop when we have found a diagnosis of RP because in 20 to 30% of cases, there is another additional disease. So I'd be happy to just brief you through the page, which is about the way to discover or think about relapsing polychondritis, because there's something very important. In a majority of cases, 60% of cases, it starts what we call the classical way by a chondritis. It can be a chondritis of the ear, chondritis of the nose, another chondritis, but it starts with a chondritis. And at that stage, it's not too difficult to recognize the disease if the doctor knows what it is. But the problem is that in 40% of cases, it's stuck by something else. It can be articular manifestations, it can be tricky respiratory symptoms, ENT symptoms, skin or eye symptoms. In, in that condition, it is difficult to be sure that it's going to be relapsing polychondritis. And I, I believe a few uh, EPAGs and patients are following us today. Sometimes you have to wait for several months or several years so that a chondritis will appear and everybody will say, oh, but now we know where the joint pain was coming from. And retrospectively, it is possible to make the diagnosis. But this is important in 40% of cases, the beginning, the start is a difficult. So I just wanted to remind you of what is typical and all these tables, you find them in the recommendation, in the PNDS. So I'm showing them today, but if you want to find them again, just go to this, to this um, document. So you see that a huge majority of the patients will have chondritis, especially of the ear, usually bilateral, not always at the same time. Also in the nose, up to 65% of patients, but there are other types, especially con sternocostal chondritis or costochondritis, and unfortunately in around 30% of cases, an involvement of the respiratory tract. But we all know that um, relapsing polychondritis is actually a very systemic disease, so there are other organ, joint involvement, eye involvement, um, audio vestibular involvement, with sometimes vertigo, with hearing difficulties, skin, heart, CNS, and hematological difficulties. So I'm not going to dig into the details, but it's just to say that you have a little section about each of these manifestations in the PNDS, so you can have a detailed look if you want. What I believe is more important is to highlight what looks like relapsing polychondritis, but is not relapsing polychondritis, especially in the ears. Sometimes people are very confused by localized dermatological conditions. It can be an eczema or psoriasis of the ear. By chronic lupus or sometimes sarcoidosis, you can have lesions looking a little bit like relapsing polychondritis. And when you have deformities, it can be the consequence of a hematoma of the ear, especially in people who practice contact sports, boxing, karate. So this is something we should always look at at the ear interrogation. And finally, there are some other diagnoses that should be known by doctors. It is physiological to get red ears some, from time to time during the day. Transitory, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, red ears without pain. This is just a kind of flush, vasomotor redness that we do nothing about. And of course, there's a disease which is not very common, but called Winkler's disease. It is small and pa painful nodules of the helix. And that is a condition that should be recognized and is not the same as relapsing polychondritis. I will go through, I will go through the, the other organ involvements and other differential diagnosis. Uh, for instance, for the nose, I, I think it's important to um, make a clear point that this is not a granulomatosis with polyangiitis GPA, but you see that we provide a detailed list of what is a mimicker in the nose of relapsing polychondritis. And it's the same for the trachea. When you have a stenosis, it can be post-intubation or post-traumatic. Again, you have GPA, 
And then there is a full collection of differential diagnoses. It can be COPD, it can be infections, it can be Crohn's, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, IgG4. So there are other diagnoses which may involve the trachea and that rheumatologist internist should think about. I think something very important with the uh, recommendations is that they provide a list of tests, additional examinations, exams that are recommended, that should not be done, and that should sometimes be done depending on the context. So what the PNDS recommend has the needed to be performed systematically is a baseline EKJ, a pulmonary function testing, and I believe what is the most important examination is CT scan of the neck and the thorax, and it has to be inspiratory and expiratory. That is very, very important because you can see thickening and calcification of the uh, tracheal rings, or you can have dynamic changes in the trachea. And just a few days ago, I was in Panlar in Colombia with a friend and colleague, Marcella Ferrada, and we discussed that sometimes a typical asthma is a presentation of uh, relapsing polychondritis, and that dynamic changes in the trachea is so important to make the diagnosis not of asthma, but of relapsing polychondritis. And finally, we need an echocardiography. So that is absolutely recommended. I'm just showing you a very typical aspect of a CT scan of someone with relapsing polychondritis. You see that the trachea at the center is thickened, it's calcified, and because the posterior part is not cartilage, it's membranous, it is respected, it is not involved, only the anterior part, at least in some patients. Then I like this table is what should be done according to the context. So not for everybody is the ENT consultation with an audiogram. It can be a brain MRI. It can be a CT scan of the face, a biopsy of the mucosa of the nose, eye checkup, X-ray or ultrasound of the joints of uh, MRI of the spine. Sometimes a CT scan. This is this PET scanner is actually a, a full body a PET scanner. And, and that can be helpful in some situations. What is more important, I believe, is what should not be done in the way what is not recommended. It can be done, of course, in special circumstances, but it's not a general recommendation. And we do not recommend a biopsy of the ear because it's not very useful for the diagnosis. Usually you get a little triangle and it tells you inflammation and it's very specific. It's the same for the fibroscopy of the lung and the biopsy of the trachea. A biopsy of the trachea is extremely dangerous in this disease and is absolutely not recommended. And finally, um, sometimes people will ask you for very specific antibodies in the blood, those of relapsing polychondritis, collagen type 2, matrilin type 1, and they are actually not very useful. It's not standardized. It's difficult to get, it's not reimbursed. We, we advocate not to do that. So usually when you have done that, uh, you have ruled out what is not relapsing polychondritis, you have done this confirmatory test. Well, you have the diagnosis and it should be announced to the patient. And this is always a very important step because we all know that announcing a, a diagnosis of a chronic disease is going to get a strong impact on persons with doubts. Am I going to survive? How am I going to live a normal life? So we believe that it should be done in a dedicated consultation and that it's important to present an information that should be tailored to the level of understanding and especially to make a focus on the main signs of relapse because we want the patients to contact us again as early as possible in case of relapse. And I know that uh, some of you, many of you actually are, are, are coming from patient association, patient organizations, and we believe it is so important to, to, that the person is, is not left alone, that we give a little detail about who can be contacted for additional information. 
Um, the PNDS is uh, suggesting a therapeutic patient education program uh, with lots of details about what can be included. And I think that's amazing. But I have to say uh, that I don't know many centers in, in which there is a dedicated information program for RP. It, it would be great to be everywhere. And I'm happy to announce that we are working on that within Reconnect to make at least an online course uh, with a module of relapsing polychondritis. And uh, I think this will help improve the quality of care. Then there is a very important step, is the assessment of the severity of, of the prognosis. And I'd like to say that there are three main groups of patients with relapsing polychondritis, and they have diverse prognosis. When it is chondritis of the ear or of the nose, and only that, the prognosis is quite good. When it's the respiratory involvement that predominates, usually it's not so good. And we also know that some of the patients with hematological involvement may have not such a good prognosis as the others. And actually we can make three groups based on survival. And you see that persons with only a minor chondritic involvement have of course very good survival. And I want to say that when I say minor, it means that it's not going to be lethal, but of course this has severe consequences on the daily life, on the quality of life. So minor should not be heard as not important. It should be heard as minor impact on survival. And we all know that uh, there is a great discovery that has been done just a few years ago, which is the overlap between hematological involvement, relapsing polychondritis, and vexes. And I'll, I'm coming back to that in a minute. Just before, I want to come back to what I've said in the introduction, which is that in 20% of cases, there is another diagnosis which is associated with RP. And so the PNDS is recommended or suggesting a list of diseases that we doctors have to think about and ask ourselves, do we have an overlap, RP and something else? And the most common associations are in the list. But of course, I think this has been a bit changed, updated because of the discovery of VEXAS. Uh, we know that it is an acquired mutation in UBA1, a somatic, and that there are some slight differences between patients with pure relapsing polychondritis and vexus presenting as relapsing polychondritis. And there's a nice French paper by Kitri uh, that was published um, two years ago about that. I just want to show you that in vexus, as you probably know, most of the patients or almost all patients are actually male. You can see that they are older, and you can see that there are some clinical differences with the regular cases of relapsing polychondritis. Fever is more common. Skin lesions are more common. You also have a higher prevalence of pulmonary infiltrate and heart involvement. You see that it's 0.0, .0 in relapsing polychondritis and that it's more common in vexes. And of course, you have hematological involvement that is way more common in vexes patients. Finally, there are differences in the routine blood tests. Uh, patients with vexus RP usually have anemia, microcytic anemia, they have low platelet counts, and they have higher inflammation in the blood with high levels of CRP. And I believe we all already know that the probability to reach remission if you have vexus RP is less favorable than if you have a regular form of relapsing polychondritis. So I think I've been through the main elements for the diagnosis, for the uh, prognosis. Now we need to move to the treatment itself. And I think it's important to remind everybody that in a majority of cases, relapsing polychondritis will evolve with periods of flares and remission. And it can be very long remission. So that is really great. And unfortunately, around 50%, 15% of patients will have a continuously progressive form or active form. And we know that the treatment of RP is complicated because we have no randomized control trial, no very high quality data. So I'm going to show you what we have. But anyhow, the treatment should include two things, 
treatment of flares and background treatment with the idea to reduce the risk of flares, but also to help reducing the amount of corticosteroids because it is typically in disease in which we use high amounts of corticosteroids and we really need to do something to try to decrease this amount. So on the screen, you have the list of drugs that can be used. I think you are not going to be surprised. NSAIDs, colchicine, cortisone, sometimes dapsone for chondritis, and of course, immunosuppressive drugs, and they can be conventional drugs or more targeted therapies, jack inhibitors, but nothing of this is formally proven. So again, it's very much a discussion with your physician or physicians, especially in the context of a reference center. It's not one drug will fit everybody. It's, it's an individual selection. And sometimes it's also a matter of trial and error. We start with something, it does not work. We, we try something else. So we have to be very modest here. So now I'd like to move to the recommendations by themselves and start by the minor chondritis of the nose and ears. And again, the word minor here is not to be heard as not important. On the contrary, it just means that it does not impact survival, but of course it's painful and the consequences in daily life can be very important. And usually when it starts with chondritis of the ear of the nose, we start with NSAIDs or more commonly corticosteroids. And it's always the same. Um, people are asking me several times per month, how much shall I give? Well, you have a little bit of details. Um, usually we start at least 0 0.5 milligram kilogram. And it, we recommend to taper the corticosteroids over no more than 10 days. So that, that is okay for the first episode or second episode but we know that it will sometimes come again and again. And so that we need to start background treatments. And what we recommend first is colchicine. Usually I do six months of colchicine to see if it works. And if it's not enough, we add or we replace colchicine by matotrexate and wait a little bit to see whether it works. Then there's the question of respiratory involvement. And I like the fact that the recommendation is highlighting that we need to collaborate with our colleagues from pneumology uh, for the uh, ears, nose and throat specialist. But in that kind of context, we need to discuss all together. And really the idea is to control the inflammation as fast as possible, because we all know and understand that it is potentially a complicated involvement that can be a problem for breathing. So what we recommend is to start corticosteroid therapy, same doses, relatively high doses, for at least three weeks. And then to try to reduce very progressively, you see that we recommend 10 milligrams at six months. So it is not a fast taper. And this is because we know that we need a lot of corticosteroids to control the disease. So of course we can add infusions of methylprednisolone. Uh, you put them in, in the IV for one to three days, it can help, but sometimes it's not enough. And of course, we cannot use corticosteroids alone. We need to add something else. And what we need to add depends a little bit upon the severity. If it is very severe, the person is the intensive care unit with acute respiratory failure, what we recommend is to do infusions of methylprednisolone and then IV cyclophosphamide. So it's a strong drug, but this is really based on, I mean, expert opinion, but also a bit of feedback from the uh, um, retrospective or prospective series that this is a way sometimes to save patients in the ICU. And I believe this is very important. What is not recommended so clearly is what to do if it's not so severe. I usually go for MMF but it's a very open discussion. I believe we are more clear about interventional fibroscopy. To say that some patients may have balloon dilation or bronchoscopic dilation, or sometimes a stent, but that we need to be very careful. And I believe the most important line is in red. Fibroscopy should only be performed by really trained operators with resuscitation facilities nearby. It, it is a dangerous act 
to go inside the respiratory tract of someone with relapsing polychondritis. And it should not be done by someone who is not very, very skilled and, and, and knows what it is or she is doing. Where I am a bit disappointed, I would say with ourselves, because I contributed to that, is that the treatment of other manifestations is not very well codified. Uh, we agree that there is no good evidence in the literature. And so that's, uh, we may pick ideas from uh, different diseases, different organ involvement, but nothing is formally codified. And when it's severe, of course, we can use high doses of corticosteroids. Uh, but then it depends a little bit on the type of involvement. I just want to say that when we published with my uh, colleague, uh, friend, and uh, co-coordinator, Simon uh, Rednik uh, from Cluj in Romania, the, when we published this study of the, the recommendations published, we gave a little bit more detail about the strategy that we recommend. So if you are a bit unsure about which treatments to use, you can have a look at this paper. And again, I'm showing you a QR code. If you screen the QR code, it gets immediately in your telephone uh, for free, of course. Another paper, which I believe is really useful, is the one from Guillaume Moulis from Strasbourg about the use of biologics in relapsing polychondritis. Um, this was done in 2018. Uh, we had four, 100, 105 lines of biologics um, prescribed in 41 patients, and we analyzed these, uh, these data. And as you can see, a majority of patients needed biologics had TNF inhibitors, especially infliximab and adalimumab, but other treatments can be prescribed. But I just want to show you uh, the column called CR achieved. This is complete remission. And you can see that complete remission achieved during the first six months well, the numbers are usually very low. Um, be careful for golimumab is only three patients. So I don't think that this is a good reflection of the proper efficacy. So it means that when you need to take a biologic, well, you can pick the one you want, but it is important to know that rituximab is usually not working very well. And that despite these biologics, the efficacy is not going to be extraordinary. And we are all confronted daily or at least sometimes to complicated cases with a, a RP that are difficult to treat. And of course, the impact upon patient's life is complicated. If you want to get additional details about everything that has been published for the treatment of relapsing polychondritis, well, it's a job we did with uh, Arthur petit Demange, who was a, a resident in our department. We did a systematic literature review in 2022. So this is very much updated. And again, if you scan the QR code, you will get all the details of all the treatments for the, uh, the biologics and the treatment of relapsing polychondrosis. And well, within the frame of Reconnect, we are working, I believe, quite well. And I would like to, to acknowledge the, the work of uh, the Romanian group, and especially Laura Damien, who published a very interesting paper about severe eye, eye involvement, severe ocular involvement, in relapsing polychondritis. And it gives lots of very great details. And to be honest, we used this paper in our department just 10 days ago. We had, we had a very severe case. And I just reviewed that what we did was in line. So it's always the same. I think we doctors have to be very modest when we are confronted to very rare and very severe manifestations of very complicated cases. I think it's best to double check that what we're doing is in agreement with everybody else. Um, in these uh, PNDS, in these recommendations, we have a little lines about the additional therapeutic measures. I I'm not going to go through everything, but you know that uh, we can suggest some support measures. Uh, persons uh, being treated with immunosuppressive agents should be vaccinated. Uh, there's the importance of uh, physiotherapy and lots of other things that we need to think about, especially an emergency card. It's a rare disease. I believe every patient with RP should get a, a personal emergency card with the phone number of someone who knows to give an advice. Then when we've done all that is the follow-up. And basically the follow-up is to check the level of disease activity, the severity, to, to check for acceptability, efficacy, and tolerability of treatments. And of course, to look for complications. 
And we have precised in a way what is the, the typical frequency for that. And we recommend that a person with very active lapsing polyechondritis should be seen initially at least monthly, not by the rheumatologist, but at least by the general practitioner to be sure that the treatment is working. Uh -uh. And then we can space these visits every three months, every six months, uh, sometimes every year uh, when it's been uh, quite for several, several years. But I think it's important that we have a detailed information about the frequency of the follow-up. And finally, we also agreed that we can help this monitoring with tools, validated tools that we've been uh, uh, developing in the past. Uh, many of these tools have um, contributed to that. The first one is the Relapsing Polychondritis Disease Activity Index. Uh, the other one is the RPDAM as a way to measure damage. So every year, once a year, you can measure damage and see whether it increases or not. And I am very happy to report that with the uh, disease group for relapsing polychondritis of Reconet, we have started uh, developing a new instrument, which is the RP call for quality of life. Uh, that is something very, very important to be able to assess the impact of the disease upon the daily life of persons living with RP. And this project has just been approved by the steering committee of Reconet as of two days. I'm very proud of that. And as you may guess, it's a big work. We are doing it in several languages at the same time with feedback from the literature, from patients, from experts, and uh, is a very, very heavy work. And I would like to acknowledge the participation of uh, many, many members of the RP uh, working group, especially Oliver, who is moderating the session today but also uh, my colleague, uh, Simona Rednick, who is my core co coordinator for RP for Econet. So once again, if you have not had the opportunity to download this PNDS, Protocol National de Diagnostic et de Soins for uh, Relapsing Polychondritis, you may say so right now. You just screen the QR code and it gets in your telephone. It's, it's a big, big paper, it's a big recommendation. I believe there are 50 pages, but at least Today, I have highlighted a summary of the main elements, the main chapters, showing you the most important tables, what we should do, what we should not do, and I think that's the best option. I thank you very much, and I'll be very happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurent, for this fascinating talk on uh, Relapsing polychondritis with a focus on the guidelines for the diagnosis. I think everybody would agree that we would like to listen to you for two or three more hours, oh, but well. uh, probably we, we also like to, to go into discussion with you. And I've mm -hmm. already received uh, some questions. The first question was, um, is it possible to diagnose or have relapsing polychondritis without any history or episode of chondritis, e.g. isolated tracheobronchial involvement? Mm -hmm. So actually, um, isolated tracheobronchial involvement is the sign, an indirect sign, of a chondritis in the respiratory tract. So I, I would definitely count it as a chondritis. Of course, it can be isolated a huge majority of persons with RP will have an involvement of the ears and of the nose, but it's not 100%. And so there are some patients between 10 and 15% will have isolated involvement. And I've shown you a CT scan. The picture I have shown you is very typical of that kind of involvement. So it's a yes. And then regarding no chondritis at all. Well, I've said that before, but the, the, the disease actually starts like that in 40% of cases. But when you have undifferentiated arthritis, it's really difficult to predict that it's going to be relapsing polychondritis. And usually we are treating in a very general manner. And several months later, or sometimes several years later, a chondritis appears and we are able to say, oh, but that was relapsing polychondritis from the start. But if you do not have chondritis, making the diagnosis of relapsing polychondritis is quite difficult. And, and regarding that, uh, there's another question. Uh, does a dynamic CT scan need to be done while in a flare to show that it's affected? 
So thank you. I, I believe it's not the case. I even believe that during a flare is not the best option because you need to hold the breathing, inspiratory, expiratory, you need to lie back. Uh, and this can be a bit difficult, especially in the middle of a flare. So usually the changes that there is, you can see them outside of the flare. And this is for me the best option as a, as a routine diagnosis setup for relapsing polychondritis. So Maurizio asked for the behavior of the disease that seems to be some clinical aspects of auto-inflammatory disease. Are mm -hmm. there theories about that? So yes, uh, it's actually a very good question. What, what's, the, what's, the, what's the rational, what's the pathogenesis? Is this an auto-inflammatory disease? Well, I believe we are more and more recognizing new genetic variants that have been associated with RP or with related disease. And my guess is that it is a complicated spectrum and that in the following years, in the next years, we will understand better the mechanisms that are going underneath. Um, there are lots of surprising things. One of these surprising things is that you can have a very severe flare in the ears and the CRP level can be zero. So that's the kind of contrast that is really strange. And I, I know there are many teams worldwide working on that, working on the genetics of RP, and I'm sure additional progress will be made. Uh, the main progress was the discovery of EXAS. Also, the NIH team has reported new mutations associated with RP, but I'm sure many more is to come. And that's Another question which goes to that direction about categorizing RP into the three subgroups and uh, management and treatment reasons for these different subgroups. I think it's for VEXAS, it's obvious. Um, and perhaps, what do you think? We, we, sh we should renew all the old experiences because we have a mixture of VEXAS and relapsing polychondritis. Oh, I'm sure we that a huge majority of the male patients in the group with hematological involvement, especially if you have late onset RP, if you have heart involvement, lung involvement, skin involvement, an important proportion of these patients may probably be reclassified as vexus. And then in the context of a question of what is the best treatment for that? Well, it's a very emerging disease in a way. And I, I believe that the patients with vexus should be discussed and are ideally when it's possible, included in trials. I believe most countries have at least registries, but it is important that we understand better what works or does not work, because we've seen that the prognosis is not so good. So we really need to make fast progress for the therapeutic uh, uh, management of vexus. So the next question is on the involvement of intervertebral disc or menisci of the knee. Are there any signs of that? Because it's not so common published. So I'm sorry, I didn't hear your, your I heard um, interventional, but I didn't hear what uh, the, the question is of on the involvement of the intervertebral disc of the or of the menisci of the knee. Is there anything oh. reported on that? Okay. So it, it, there are some cases, it's the same as peripheral involvement of, of the joint, but I don't think there's something specific about the knee in relapsing polychondritis. It's just the joints in general. And well, the, the, the management is the management of uh, articular flares, actually. So usually we start a, a background treatment. Usually I start metotrexate. And when it is not enough and we have a phritis flares coming again and again, well, we step up with biologics but truly the question is, is there an overlap with spondyloarthritis? If it's the case, I will more take some drugs that are indicated in spondyloarthritis. And if it's not the case, usually I take drugs that may be more indicated in rheumatoid arthritis. Sometimes I don't know, and then I go for TNF inhibitors when it's not contraindicated. Okay. So next question is, uh, do you favor starting biologics early on a patient with mild involvement to prevent further decline? So thank you, that's a great question. And it's actually a very contemporary question that you'd ask across all diseases. I'm also coordinator for lupus, and it's a, it's a very important point in other diseases. I think we don't know. Um, the concept is really interesting. Shall we 
use strong treatments, early treatments to prevent damage. Uh, maybe it works, but then we need to prove that it works. And I'd like to say that maybe in lupus we will have an answer because there are randomized controlled trials, but in relapsing polychondritis, we do not have any robust evidence. So it really depends upon the presentation. I, I think that when there is systemic involvement, articular involvement, we, we need to step up a little bit. We cannot just do colchicine. We, we need to, to do more than that, for sure. The next question is if you uh, suggest routine screening for UBA1 mutation patients without hematological manifestation? Oh, that's a very difficult question. Uh, well, I, I would say yes. Um, this is a very much a matter of debate, but I think VEXIS is not just VEXIS RP. It's a complex spectrum. Not all patients have chondritis. You have other types of manifestation, skin only and so on. So I'm keeping my mind very open, thinking that we do not know much. And I, I believe that uh, most patients should be tested, actually, especially male patients, especially if they have additional criteria. Okay. Now there's a question from the United States. Um, person who reports that uh, the son has a relapsing polychondritis and finally found a rheumatologist who believes and understands but he had only minimal follow-ups. Do you have any suggestion for follow-up for the son of the listener? So thank you. It's a difficult question because we know that rheumatologists, we are already not too many. Pediatric rheumatologists are very few and pediatric rheumatologists in the States, United States, there is not even one per state. Um, so this is very, very difficult. Well, I, I believe pediatricians um, may do a little effort to learn about the disease. And I, I think this is where a, a general guidelines can help. It happens, you, you are being referred to someone with a rare disease you are not an expert of. Well, either there's someone who knows better, then I think it, it, it's important to, to get advice. But if you don't, well, I think as a doctor, you have the responsibility to learn about the disease of your patient. Next question is on the differential diagnosis to Kogan syndrome with, with ear chondritis and vestibular syndrome. Mm -hmm. So thank you. It's a very difficult question because these are both very uncommon disease. Um, I, I say the ODO vestibular involvement in relapsing polychondritis is quite common. It may have very diverse presentation. Sometimes it's more an acute hearing loss. Sometimes it's a progressive hearing loss without anything additional. And sometimes it's more on the acute vertigo side. And there are lots of differential diagnoses. So in that case, usually I recommend that an MRI of the inner ear is being performed uh, with contrast to check whether you have inflammation. And this is very much a matter of discussion with ENT specialist and good um, neuroradiologist or ear uh, radiologist. You, you need expertise here. So I, I believe these complex cases should be referred within expert centers or discussed uh, on Reconet. We have, a, you know, a CPMS, a clinical management system for difficult cases. Uh, I think that's what should be done in these uh, complicated cases. Okay. The, the next question is in French. <laughs> I'm not able to, <laughs> to read it properly, but it's Merci beaucoup. Professor, pour cette présentation, dommage que... Okay, I understand. <laughs> uh, so it's thank you very much, but it's so sad there is no uh, subtitles. Well, oh, okay. Uh, so thank you for that. Okay. The next is what an amazing take talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can this motility of the esophagus be a symptom of relapsing polychondritis? So it's a great question. Uh, it would be a sign more typical of systemic sclerosis, but of course it's not specific of systemic sclerosis. I'd seen also in inflammatory myopathies. So I'd say mostly not, but sometimes, you know, there are some overlaps. So I don't want to be too strongly advocating for some against something. It's usually not within the typical spectrum. Okay. Can you comment on the relapsing pulling chondritis emergencies? Sure. So that's a difficult question, actually. 
We all know that uh, persons with relapsing polychondritis arrive to the emergency room, and uh, usually nobody has heard of relapsing polychondritis. So I, I believe some of you already know that there are emergency documents for relapsing polychondritis within the context of Orphanet. It's something that can be accessed by any department of emergency, and it provides a summary of what can or should be done in an emergency situation uh, for patients with uh, rare diseases. So this is also a European project. Uh, I, I believe this is very important to note that there is. Okay. So the next question is from a US patient who has followed the mild path and he asks for uh, researchers and practitioners in the United States. Okay. So well, I suppose uh, there are several options actually. Uh, one of my good friend, colleague, and uh, amazing and knowledgeable person about relapsing polychondritis is Marcella Ferrara. She's one of the person who has discovered Vexus, working in the University of uh, um, Maryland, Baltimore. Okay. And next is thank you i started with bechet uh, 30 years ago a new diagnosis of relapsing polychondritis seven years ago and now rheumatoid arthritis six months ago why is the picture changing mm -hmm. so thank you very much um, there are some um, situations called overlap of diseases when you met several criteria of several diseases at the same time or changing in time um, I think is because the background uh, of these disease is somehow shared. But I'd like to make a quick focus on the overlap between Bechet's disease and relapsing polychondritis. It's been already described very well. It's known as the magic syndrome. Unfortunately, I believe it has nothing magic for the patients. And uh, it's this association of, of ulcers, oral ulcers, genital ulcers, but also chondritis. Well, usually what I say is that when it's like that, you have to find a treatment that is a common denominator of the different diseases that the person has. And for my opinion, I, in those patients, I would screen for vexes, especially Absolutely, if they, uh, I believe it's... Uh, yeah. Especially with the overlap, yeah. So the next is when differentiating between tracheobronchopathy, osteochondro plastica and relapsing polychondritis, what should you look for? Uh, it's really complicated. I really believe that the image I have shown with this thickening and calcification of the anterior portion, which is not specific, is an element that is important. I also believe that what we recommend is a CT scan of the neck and the thorax. And there's a reason why we are recommending the neck, is that you can have alteration on the cartilages of the neck, thyroid cartilage, cricoarytenoid cartilage, that can be little, you know, like nipples, little pieces missing. And that is an additional indirect clue towards the diagnosis of relapsing polychondritis. Okay, the next question is on methotrexate. If there are no inflammatory markers, but reasonable levels of joint pain, would you still uh, consider methotrexate? So that's a very difficult question. I think it relates to a question we, we come across uh, across all inflammatory diseases. If there is nothing to see and there is pain, shall we increase the treatment? Well, I think you should discuss with your rheumatologist on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, usually a joint ultrasound is recommended. Sometimes there is nothing to see at the clinical examination. It's not swollen. But when you perform the ultrasound, you will have subclinical synovitis, and that is a definitive yes for treatment, I believe. If it's pain, you have no strong inflammatory timing, you have normal ultrasound, this should be discussed. Next question is uh, on a connection to Marfan or ehlers danlos syndrome. Uh -huh. Okay, so typically these are not connective tissue diseases. Um, I don't actually believe that relapsing polychondritis is a connective tissue disease in a way. Uh, this word that we, we, we use that comes from the past may not be the most appropriate. Uh, lupus is not, for instance. I also believe that in the context of relapsing polychondritis, 
we are probably more in the spectrum of autoinflammation, as we've been discussing before, but it's complicated. These two diseases are not related. So the next question is from a person who has a Waldenstrom disease for seven years and then diagnosed with relapsing polychondritis three years ago. And she questions if she could have these two diseases at the same time or it's just one uh, with a manifestation. Mm -hmm. um, I apologize. I didn't hear the first diagnosis. It's Waldenstrom disease. Ah, okay. So th that's something important because um, mo monoclonal gemophilacy in the context of RP and or vexus is something that is really being studied right now. So I would ask this question to your internist or rheumatologist to, to check whether additional tests should be made. The next is on sternocostal chondritis. What mm -hmm. are some of the key clinical presentations? Can symptoms, symptoms be broader than the typical inflammatory pain commonly associated with costal chondritis? So it is a difficult question because it's one of the less well-documented manifestations. When you look at the books, textbooks, it's reported in 40% of patients. But in my experience, it is way less. And I'd say either you have the typical swelling that you see, sometimes it's a little bit red, and sometimes it's interesting to do an ultrasound. But sometimes you have sequela damage. And I think a very important element of the clinical examination of someone with suspected RP is to have a, a look at the thorax. And occasionally you can have a sign of damage with the cartilage being destroyed and like a hole, you know, like a deep cavity that is replacing the cartilage. And that is a strong element towards the diagnosis, I believe. Okay. So next question is, how do you follow uh, relapsing polychondritis patients over time? So for example, which lab tests, which pulp, pulmonary function tests you mm -hmm. do, echocardiography, chest CT, audiograms, how often do you perform it? So we, we did not agree uh, upon a, a specific rhythm for follow-up. We just recommend the regular recheck of these manifestations. And there's a reason for that, is that we don't have specific evidence that each manifestation or which each test should be redone at a specific frequency. What I would say is that when we are confronted to a flare, especially a severe flare, my attitude is usually to recheck a little bit of everything mm -hmm. to see if there's something new. And then it depends. The baseline examination, if there is nothing new, I redo them every three years maybe. When it's very active, I tend to do it more commonly. But again, beware of um, CT scans with lots of x-rays, inspiratory, expiratory, I do not redo CT scans every year systematically to, to avoid over, um, you know, um, irradiation. Okay. The next is with respiratory involvement, what are indications for changing a biologic? Can mm -hmm. those patients expect to have the treatment for life? So that's an that's a, a important and difficult question. I think it really relates to what belongs to disease activity and what belongs to damage. I believe the biologic will be useful to control disease activity, stepping it down, putting it in remission. But then a significant proportion of patients with respiratory involvement will have the tracheal damage as a chronic condition with tracheal malacia. And in that context, obviously biologics are not going to improve the situation. So acute, um, acute phase, beginning phase, active phase, but I don't think that on a long-term basis, when you have damage, you can get any benefit. Okay, now we have the last question. Would you expect tracheal wall thickening in relapsing polychondritis to resolve or reduce on imaging after symptom improvement? Yes, after successful absolutely. treatment? Uh, that is something that we see, that there is a change in the thickening of the wall uh, before the episode of chondritis and after, I mean, in the middle of the episode and after. Yes. yes and would, would you, in that case, conduct imaging to assess treatment efficacy? I, I don't think so. Usually I base my reasoning on the clinical symptoms. Is the patient going better? Uh, because this is not fully validated. As I said before, it's irradiating. I don't recommend performing an endobronchial echography 
There are papers about that, but I believe it's a slightly dangerous examination in that context. So I just guide my reasoning on the overall discussion with the patient. Okay, and there are many things in the question side, but there are no more questions at the yeah, moment. Perfect. Is there any more question we, we could answer? Uh, okay. So there are many thanks. We, we had more than 40 audience, um, okay. which, which is quite a good uh, number. I think we had a good discussion. We had mm -hmm. a very good talk and I saw uh, a very stimulating discussion later on. And now uh, there are many fantastic presentations. Uh, it's so helpful. Thank you very much, um, but no more questions. So That's again, perfect. thanks a lot. We, Thank you very we will much. have it Thank you, Oliver. preserved and we'll see it on YouTube. And I think we could say stay connected to Enriconet. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you all. Thank you for being here. And thank you to Reconet. I think it's a rare disease and that is an amazing opportunity to let more people know about this rare disease. So that's one of the main goals of Reconet. So that's amazing. Thank you, Oliver. Good day to you all.